I think we're going to war for real. I'll tell you one little story that I probably have never told anybody before. We got hit with a NVA sapper company supported by infantry. It's not easy and you know, that one was tough, but fortunately it worked out for us. Welcome to War Stories, conversational military history. What's going on, everyone? My name is Preston Stewart with Sayer Payne from War Stories and joined today with by Autumn Hendrickson. Autumn, thanks for taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. So this is second iteration. We had some sound problems. So we, we got like three minutes into your story. Um, but I'm going to do a quick teaser to say Autumn has been doing some really cool projects on uh, World War II history, diving into specific stories of soldiers from a certain area. So Autumn, with that little teaser, you mind giving a little background on who you are? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I, uh, I was born up in Massachusetts, but I, I didn't stay for very long after I was born. I ended up moving down to Florida for like the first 10 years of my life. Um, and then I came back to Massachusetts to live with, um, my two former foster moms. Um, and when I came back, I had, I was kind of in that point and I think young people's lives where they start to really connect with the place that they grow up in and they start to feel something for it like it's sure. not just the like streets or the you know the buildings it's like oh this is my home uh and so when I came to Reading Massachusetts to live uh with my two former foster moms I I mean I was going through a lot I was it was a big transition for me it was a there was just a lot of change going on in my life that I was not entirely ready for because I was in like fifth grade um and as time went on like Reading to me started to become more and more like a, a safe place for me to be a place where I felt loved a place where I felt wanted um and I always had like I went through all you know the schools from like fifth grade on in Reading and I started to I like I started to build like connections with my teachers and connections with like my peers and stuff and I really started to feel like at home and um I was I was a pretty good student in school I I always loved like English I loved history I was never like a really big nerd about either one but I I could handle myself and I enjoyed it yeah. I looked forward to it um it wasn't how I felt about math that's for sure like math was like get me out of here um mm -hmm. but um so basically I uh between my freshman and sophomore years of of high school I started doing genealogy research um because my two moms had said we were going to go on a vacation to Nova Scotia. And when I mentioned it to my adoptive mother, who also happens to be a, a, like an actual blood relative of mine too, um, she said, well, Autumn, like our family actually comes from Nova Scotia. I don't know like the details, but I know that they come from Nova Scotia. So I was like, all right, I should figure this out if we're going to go there. You know, it's not like I, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm basically still a kid like I'm not sure you know maybe I don't know if I'll go there again whatever yeah so I was like I'm gonna do all this research and I did I I found like all the stuff I went all the way back on like my um my biological mother's side of the tree and we went to this like my mom's instead of going to like Halifax which probably would have been a lot more fun. Um, we went to this town in the middle of nowhere, like up on the northern side of Nova Scotia. Um, everyone that lived there was like, it was really funny. Like uh, someone was like, oh, what brings you here? You know, and I was like, oh, well, my family, the McDonald's come from here, you know, and they go, there's a lot of McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> from here. Didn't you know, narrow it so, down. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So um, but I, I still have a very vivid memory of visiting the grave of my fourth great grandfather there. Um, wow. and I, yeah, and it was up, up the hill in the old part of the cemetery. And I, there was like some clover that had been growing. You could see the little depression in the, the ground. And I, I don't know, there was something about that moment for me that was really special. And I think that's when I started to love history. I started to wonder what his life was like. Mm -hmm. You know, what did and he was? He came to Nova Scotia when he was four years old from Scotland. Um, he was born in 1800. He lived to 1885. I mean, the amount of things that happened between 1800 and 1885. Seriously. You know, like this, and this, mm -hmm. you know, it was a, it was a cool story to me. Um, 
what got me into kind of war history was when I started to realize my biological dad's side of the family was kind of a militaristic family. They, they had a, a history of serving, um, but not a single one, uh, not really anyone in my like immediate family um, served in World War II. They all did their bleeding in World War I. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and in fact, my, my like first cousin, four times removed, was the first one that kind of like I noticed and I was like, oh, um, had a date of death of October 11th, 1918. And I was like, okay, World War I ended a month later. So, uh, you know, what happened? Well, he, he died of the Spanish flu aboard a Navy vessel, mm. uh, right as his wife had just had their only child. Holy cow. Uh, yeah. And it, it was like, it was sad. And I was like, I need to like learn about this. Like I need to, if this is my family's like heritage, I need to learn about it. So I got into world war one and um, my senior year of high school, I took a, I took a history elective because I wanted to take a history class my senior year, but seniors don't have to take one. Like, so I was like, well, let me make room in my schedule. So I took uh, World War II European theater, which was a class at my high school. Um, wow, that's cool. Yeah, we definitely was, didn't have anything that specific. I, I know, yeah. No it, was, it was awesome. Um, I will be honest, though, I, I didn't retain a whole lot from it. I, I retained the major things, but I didn't retain a lot of the details, primarily because the way I always found that I could connect and remember things was through relating myself to them. And like I said, there was not a single person in my immediate family who served in World War II. So it, it wasn't like I had a real connection. The only person I had was my adoptive dad's dad, who had served in World War II, but I didn't really process that until after he had died. So it still felt so distant to me. There were kids in my class. There was a girl in my class who brought in a bag of sand from Omaha Beach. What? that her yeah yeah and it had in it it had in it like some of the like the ammo um cartridges and stuff that her like like her great uncle had and he just thought in the moment he was like I'm gonna like put this in like the bag that they gave me for my m1 grand <laughs> and I'm just gonna carry it around with me so he carried around this bag of sand <laughs> um you know and I'm like I have nothing like I like I can't like I can like emotionally on some level like relate because that's how I relate to things I emotionally kind of try to connect myself I couldn't do it so the end of my senior year came around the pandemic hit um right as I was like March of my senior year and then I got offered a job to write for the newspaper over the summer which was awesome except it was COVID summer and I was like, I've got no clue what I'm going to write about. Um, so I got one of those like bright ideas. I was like, this is going to be a great idea. I'm not going to follow through on it, but it's a great idea. And I could, I could say that I, I had it. And I'd like to at least say I tried since this is actually my job. <laughs> I have to try to find something to write about. It's like, what if I wrote about like people from Reading, Massachusetts in World War I? And I, because that was my thing, but I was like, mm -hmm. Mm, World War I is not really something that people think about a lot anymore. It's so far away. It's kind of one of those forgotten wars. It's kind of like Korea. Like people yep. kind of forget that the U.S. was even in it. So I was like, okay, but people remember World War II, you know, and I was like, all right. And world, you know, dang, <laughs> World War II, I guess, you know. So I was like, all right, there's got to be people from my town that served in World War II, right? So... I sat down, um, I told myself I would try. I sat down with Ken Burns' documentary, The War, excellent documentary. Yeah. Uh, a box of goldfish. And I looked through Ancestry's draft cards that were sorted for Reading, Massachusetts. And uh, to put it briefly, I didn't find nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't find nothing. Um, How so big is Reading? Reading is uh, today has a population of I want to say twenty five thousand people. Um, during that's, a, that's not a big town. No, it's not. It's not. I mean, it, it could be a if you grabbed a hundred thousand or three hundred thousand and said I'm going to tell this town's story in World War II, that'd be a daunting task. But twenty five, that's that's tough. 
Well, I mean, 25,000, and then if you think their population grew after the war. Yeah, for sure. So in the 60s, a lot of people came to Reading. So um, the, during the war, the population of the town was significantly lower. In fact, the amount of people that were like in the, in the schools in Reading was the total amount of people that are at just at the high school today. Like there's about like a thousand kids at the high school today. That's how many kids were in the school system in the 1940s. So, you know, it was Sounds a much right, smaller, yeah. yeah, it was a much smaller yeah. town. Um, and then there were, you know, the two like neighboring communities were slightly larger Wakefield, which is right next to Reading, was slightly larger than Reading at the time and is slightly larger today. And then Stoneham, um, which was smaller, I think, than Reading, but it's about the same size now um, as Reading. Um, so it's a very small like community, but it, it is very much a community, um, especially because Reading used to be all one place. It used Reading used to encompass uh, Linfield, Wakefield, Stoneham, Reading, and North Reading, um, and then they split off uh, at some point. Would you call it a suburb of Boston or is it too far out to be called a suburb? It's a, it is a suburb, I'd say. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's about 30 minutes out of Boston. Um, it's definitely, it was close enough that that's why people moved there. Mm -hmm. um, like a lot mm -hmm. of people in the aftermath of the war, that's where they went. They went to Reading, to the suburbs, you know, but it was just that right distance um, from all of the big things going on in the city. This is interesting because I'm, I'm sure you've heard of um, Bedford, Virginia in your time, yes. right? So yes. um, Bedford boys, uh, Ian yes. Hershaw wrote a really good book about him, but, but Bedford was, for anybody who doesn't know, um, they sent a lot of soldiers into the same division, regiment, battalion, even Italian. company, Alpha Company, company of mm -hmm. the uh, 116th Infantry, 16th. I think it was. Yeah, yeah it um, was, yeah. And they, they were the first wave on Omaha Beach, Dog Green Sector in the the ramp came down and almost the entire company was wiped out in a few minutes, which mm -hmm. was tragic, but more so when you consider that they kept that group from Bedford together. Mm -hmm. So this little small town in Virginia lost a lot of people. A lot of men. Minutes. Yeah. In turn, Bedford has kind of become famous for that. But it, I don't think Reading, you've kind of done the opposite with Reading. It's not like there's some big event that pulls Reading, puts Reading on the map. You're kind of starting with the soldiers and creating a story out of them. Yeah, and you know, and it's interesting, I start, as I went along, I started to learn a little bit more about how that whole thing works, like, like, that was a National Guard unit, that's why Bedford, Virginia ended up in that mm -hmm. situation, and Reading actually did send a lot of boys, there was, um, so the Yankee Division, the 26th Infantry Division, is Massachusetts National okay. Guard, um, and as you guys may know, and some of the listeners may know, when the war kind of broke out and the U.S. joined it, we started to triangularize our divisions. We started taking away brigades and putting in just three infantry regiments instead of four. And so the 182nd Infantry Regiment of the 26th Yankee Division was that fourth regiment that got pulled out. That regiment, that the, the uh, second battalion of that regiment was pulled from Reading Wakefield, Stoneham, Melrose, Malden, all those areas. And in fact, our company, like the company that we were, a lot of our boys were in was E Company, which was also, and this is a really fascinating thing. No one seems to know about this, which I think is really cool. That was actually a medical detachment. So E Company as a whole was made up of infantrymen and medics, and sometimes infantrymen who sometimes served as medics and other times served as infantry. Um, and so all of our boys were present um, when the uh, 182nd was sent to uh, the Pacific because they urgently needed units to go to the Pacific. They formed the 23rd Americal Division. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was the 182nd was the regiment on New Caledonia and the Pacific that was put into this new division. Um, and they were alongside a, uh, the 164th from, I think, North Dakota uh, and the 132nd. I'm not sure where they're from, um, but so all of our boys ended up on Guadalcanal. 
on Bougainville. Uh, many of them left and were rotated home after Bougainville, um, but some of them stayed, some of them stuck around. And a lot of our casualties that we did take, like the first man from E Company of the 182nd to be killed was from our town. Um, so and it was, yeah. <laughs> and when we, you know, these components have changed over time. And when people think of the National Guard today, it's very different from what the National Guard was in 1941. Yeah. When, when the country was mobilizing, you, you got drafted or you got, or you volunteered is probably a better example here. When you signed up, those, well, Omaha Beach is a great example, right? A National Guard division landed first in the first wave at Omaha Beach. Yeah. And they had arguably mm. just as much training as the bulk of the new soldiers in the first infantry division that was an active regular Combat. army unit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So these National Guard troops were not one week in a month in 1942. They were no. fully activated. They just happened to be in the Yankee division instead yeah. of the red one. Well, it's really funny too, because I have a, there's a story of a, a woman from my town who I interviewed who was a child, you know, growing up during the war. She had a big brother uh, who was in the National Guard. And I guess he didn't get the notice that, so for those of you that don't know, Massachusetts federalized her troops on January 16th of 1941. And so then a notice was sent out to all the, you know, National Guard members to report for duty. And her brother who was in the National Guard either didn't get it or ignored it. And one day he just didn't come home from school <laughs> because the National Guard showed up and were like, hey, remember us? Not an option, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, he was fine. He, he was okay, but it was, it, he was a little, I think, shaken. <laughs> Have many of your stories gotten into that? Um, they're, they're personal stories. You're telling individual stories. Do you get a chance to interact with family members and relatives for many of them? So I have on my radar right now, I want to say roughly 300 to 400 people. Um, out of those hundreds of people, only four of them are still alive. Most of them have long since passed. And I want to say out of those, out of that big number, I want to say I'm in contact with maybe 50 relatives. And out of those 50 relatives, I'd say about half of them are very communicative. Mm -hmm. um like sometimes like I hear from them once and I never hear from them again um other times I you know I keep up and talk with them regularly um so it is really interesting because and this is something that I think about a lot I don't know these men and women I do know them for about two to three to four years of their life though two to three to four of some of the most consequential years of their life, but sure. still nothing close to knowing them. So to me, it, it is interesting because, I mean, I'm a writer. I've always been a writer. I've always loved to tell stories. It's really hard to tell a story when you don't know anything about someone. It's for all you know, someone could have been a real ass, you know, or someone could have been a saint. But you don't know that. You have no way of knowing that. So you walk a very careful line. You also don't, you know, you don't have stories that they told. Like, for example, um, one of the articles I wrote for the paper about D-Day, um, I told a story in which a boy is very near and dear to my heart, uh, Richard Austin, who jumped in to Normandy with the headquarters company of um, I think it was the 1st Battalion of the 501st Parachute Infantry. And I told a story and I said, he may have been one of the guys who forgot the, the code word. You know, he, he may have been like, uh, 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 you know, when someone yelled at him. But I have to, I always have to say, he may have. Yeah. Or maybe he was totally on top of it. Uh, I wrote an article about Pearl Harbor. There was a guy from my town who was stationed in one of the barracks. And I kind of told a little story about maybe he was playing cards with his friends and all of a sudden they heard all this noise outside and they all sat there and looked at each other. I don't know what happened. I don't you think know? that's, yeah, but I think when you're getting into history, especially these personal stories, it's not yeah. really a, like I, I do have some videos and I feel like at times I'm hedging, but I don't think yeah. that's the case. Like 
the the did he forget the password or not? That's not to discredit him or make him sound bad. Oh Tons no, of people forgot no, that. it's just no, it's you like, don't have the definitive absolute yeah. nail down. So why take and, that stance? Yeah, and you want to tell, and that's the thing you want to tell a story. So like when I say that, I'm never concerned about like making them look bad. I'm more like want to tell my reader, did you guys know that there was a password that night? I want to, and I want to use the stories to help them understand what's going on in the bigger picture and so sometimes it's like it's hard because you can't you don't know where to place a guy you don't and in fact when I wrote the article about Richard Austin jumping into Normandy I was under the impression that he jumped in with an entirely different company you learn something new eventually you find out oh no no he wasn't with them you know so it it is like a lot of um, it's a lot of trial and error but it's a lot of like trying to do what you can with what you have and it's well it's i would the examples you're talking about are to me what they are they're just humanizing yeah because you know people are they're just everyday people as you know mm-hmm. right reading massachusetts is not special yes. no, you know all of these little where i grew up is not special yeah. uh you know it's but it's across the board especially with the 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 world war itself world war ii and um yeah, they're young and they're nervous and they think about everything else just like every anybody else mm-hmm. now. And some of them rise to do some pretty extraordinary things, but they're still ordinary, everyday people. Yeah. Um, I think that's what's special about it. And, I, you know, I, I did read it's on the Reading Post, mm-hmm. is, yeah, you know, all yeah. your writings. And, um, yeah, no, I like the way you write and it's the empathy of like trying to put yourself in the person's shoes Mm -hmm. and what does it feel like because without Mm -hmm. the feeling then it's just stats on this date with this unit these sort of things happen which has been told before nobody needs to i mean (laughs) we got books on that you don't have to rewrite that you know yeah i mean there's after action reports sitting there too like those are some of the most impersonal things that you, you know i've read like it it's I mean, even morning reports to me are more personal sometimes. Like they'll say on the bottom, like, oh, we got some beer today. Like the guy doing the morning report muster roll will say, hey, everyone got a beer. You know, the after action report is like the first battalion attacked from their, you know, their line of resistance, their main line of resistance. And then they left their, de- their line of departure. And it's, it's very impersonal. And so it's like, I, I do work really hard to try to humanize these people because to me, like on the anniversaries of some of their deaths, some, some of the times that they're wounded on the anniversaries of big battles, I'll be honest, I lay in my bed at night and I cry because I, I feel that. I feel, I can feel them. When you spend so much time reading about them, like when I, I got, I, I have access to my town's old papers and every now and then a letter home, you know, would make it into the paper or a remark would make it into the paper. Um, for context, I, I hate driving. I absolutely hate driving. But something came over me and Richard Austin from my town. He lived at 180 Prescott Street. Beautiful young man, a uh, member of a very well-known family in town, well-loved family in town. He went to Norwich University in Northfield, Vermont. Um, he, he was a cadet there when all of the cadets were called into active service in March of 1943. And I reached out to the people at Norwich and I was like, do you guys have anything on him? And if you don't, or even if you do, would you like me to send you what I have on Richard? Cause I've got, I've got so much stuff. Cause he's, he's like the guy that my moms and I always joke. I'm either him reincarnated or I'm his mother. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I drove five hours to Northfield, Vermont on a whim. Like I made an appointment the next day I was there and I remember driving through Vermont. I'd never, I've never been to Vermont actually, if you can believe that. And I remember the thing that kept echoing in my head is there was a thing in the paper, the Reading Chronicle uh, that said uh, Richard Austin wrote home to his parents and remarked about being in Northern Ireland and how it reminded him of good old Vermont. There we go. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, and to me, like going to this guy's school and like walking around this campus was like, I could, I could feel him in a way and I could feel, and, and that's how I feel about a lot of these, 
these guys that I write about is that you do kind of get some sort of feeling from them in a way like you can you can feel their anxiety or their pain a little bit but you don't really know if they felt it you just know that you would <laughs> there's you were there. it's it's interesting hearing you talk about how in depth you have to go in some of this research to figure out something about these people Richard Austin who yeah. it, random soldier in World War II right yep. um I'm guessing not a Medal of Honor recipient. So there aren't nope. these big write-ups, but you, know, nope. you know, those are the easy ones in a sense, mm-hmm. because somebody at least wrote about their action. But I hear a lot of people that, well, I have a lot of people that ask about finding information from their great uncle or great, great grandfather that was in World yeah. War II. And I think a lot of people are hoping, and it'd be awesome if this is the case, like, here's this website, go to this website, type yep. in your name, it'll give you everything. Everything, yeah. But even if you, that doesn't exist, spoiler. No, um, no, I know. Even if you could get to that website and it gave their dates of service in their unit. It's this tiny little fraction and it takes so much work um, to figure yeah. out all this stuff. It's crazy. It's detective. No, it, it really is. And it's, it's interesting that you say that because it's, uh, and it's great to hear someone else say that because I feel like sometimes people don't realize how hard it is. Um, like there are guys that I had on my radar for almost a year until I was able to realize, oh, wait, I can get their discharge papers from the state. Like, and I was like, oh my God, like, how did I not realize this? You know, and I had had people on my radar who, you know, their obituary said, oh, he was on Omaha Beach or he was in Normandy for D-Day or he was on Okinawa or something, you know, with the 96th Infantry Division. Like a lot of, a lot of the work that I do is detective work. And, and, and I, the amount of times, like, I still remember there was this one guy's story who I really, really wanted to know. And, and that's like all of them. But this one guy, Albert Stefanian, um, he was a family, a son of, you know, Armenian immigrants uh, who came to Reading. Um, and he was, according to the newspapers, and, and it's ended up being true, he was reported missing in action after landing in Sicily, but he was still riding home. But consistently, like after they had reported him as missing and his parents were like freaking out, like what's going on? <laughs> um, and it also just so happened that he was reported missing the same exact day that another man from Reading was reported missing. And that other man would go on to be reported as killed. So it was like this crazy day in town. I mean, I can't imagine like both of the mothers you know, walking around, like, everyone, like, oh, how are you, you know, like, and they found out, and finally, the army, like, three months later, were like, oh, sorry, your son's not missing, we found him, actually, he's good, he's all good, and uh, he served in Sicily, and then he went into Italy, and then um, he landed in southern France, and shortly after he landed in southern France, he got shot in the kneecap, and the war was over for him, it was over, But I couldn't tell you what unit he served in. I, I, you know, but I had something in the newspaper saying he was one of the first in the first wave on Sicily. He was member, a member of a tank crew. I had another thing saying that he had had battle credits for, um, for, you know, Sicily and for, for maybe North Africa and that he had had some credits for South, um, the invasion of Southern France. So I was able to narrow it down and I had determined he was probably a member of either the second or probably the second armored division. When I got his discharge papers, 17th armored engineer battalion. There you go. Yeah. And and I was like, I was like, yes. But some of these, the, the challenge here is sometimes you have a thousand piece puzzle that you're trying to put together, but some puzzles come with a thousand pieces and others come with two. Yeah. And you don't know that when you get started yeah. and, it, and you can be searching for that third piece for years to years. find out there is no, there no, is no third the, piece. It stopped yeah. there. Um, yeah. We did an interview recently with a World War II veteran who his granddaughter is the one who set it up. And he, he had mentioned fighting in the Battle of the Bulge with the 101st Airborne. And then they sent over, as part of the research, they sent over a picture and it was him with an 82nd Airborne patch on. I thought, uh-oh lines got crossed somewhere Mm -hmm. that unit wasn't there yeah now this Mm -hmm. whole story may not make sense 
but it was just a little, you know, he got transferred from the 82nd to the 101st. Yeah. And no, I was like, oh, it, well, now it makes sense. Okay, so you. Yeah. But I, I've never, I don't know if they have that transfer paperwork. And when you see the information from both sides, it makes sense. That's clearly what happened. Yeah. But it's just these little twists and turns that people got transferred between units. Yeah, yeah. They got reassigned. I, I it's, it's actually, it's incredibly interesting. I'm, when you deal with guys who get transferred around a lot, it is, it can get really frustrating really quickly. Oh. Um, because sometimes like when I first started my research, I fell into a trap and I'll tell you what that trap is. And then as I got, you know, more experience and stuff, I fell into the opposite trap and now I'm like kind of balancing my legs in both traps. Um, when I first started my research, the trap I fell into was if it says somewhere he served in this unit, he served in this unit, the whole war. Obviously, that's not true. And I I learned that very quickly. But I also learned I had a lot of examples in which that was true, that guys got wounded and they still were sent back to the same unit or they transferred into a unit, but they transferred into that unit like right before the unit went into combat. So the fact that they weren't in that unit like two days prior or something didn't make a difference. And then as I got more and more experienced, I started to question everything. I was like, his papers say he served in this unit, but he probably, maybe he didn't, you know, maybe he wasn't there the whole time. Um, And so one of the things that I've had to learn to balance is, um, and I I have this great book that's, I literally just got it, that's been incredibly helpful, just a U.S. Army World War II order of battle that has um, when units came overseas and stuff so that I can line it up with the discharge papers when it says someone left for you know overseas duty and for from the book where it says they made it overseas. But it's hard because you don't know um, if a guy ever served with a unit in combat. I have a guy, um, Charles Warren Jones Jr. is his name. He was an officer. Uh, he, Funnily enough, I have a newspaper article and the the way I learned about him was I was going through the papers and I was like, I've never seen this guy's name before. It was a letter he wrote home to his his mom and dad about how excited he was. He, his division, and it was very awesome. It was very easy. Said, oh, my division was activated at Fort Jackson on November 15th. So I'm like 100th Infantry Division, 100th Infantry Division. Um, And he said how excited he is to meet his men you know, that he's like, you know, he's really nervous, but he like says, you know, we'll whip them into shape no matter what, you know, we'll do this. Never served with the 100th, according to their roster, but he was definitely with them at activation. And his discharge uh, paper says 394th Infantry Regiment, 99th Infantry Division, but he's got battle credits for Tunisia, for Sicily, for Italy, and for Normandy. And, you know, so all things that the 99th were never a part of, except for the Ardennes, which he also has a battle credit for. So it's like, it's clear to me that what, yeah. (laughs) That's a lot of, he did a lot. (laughs) Yes, yes he did. And it's clear to me, it's abundantly clear to me. He didn't serve with the 100th Infantry Division and he didn't serve, likely didn't serve in combat with the 99th. He must have been one of those like high pointers from the ninth or the first division that got transferred to the 99th uh, to go home uh, because for whatever reason, that's just what happened. But it, I don't know. And uh, the, sad, the sad part is that I actually might never figure him out because of the fact that there's so many different moving pieces and what I would need in a situation like that are morning reports. And a lot of times the morning reports from after the war ends are harder to come by. Can you talk about those morning reports real quick? Just yeah. what they are, how you find them? Yeah. So morning reports um, are really, really awesome. They're really cool. Um, they're about as close to a roster as you can get without having a roster. A morning report is basically... Anytime something changes, regardless of what it is, it shows up in the morning report. So say you're an original member of the unit, you never get wounded, you never get promoted, you never get transferred, you will probably never show up in the morning reports. But if you are not one of those people and you get promoted or you maybe your your MOS changes or you're wounded and you're evacuated or you go missing or you're killed, you show up in the morning reports. So um, 
basically uh, when someone comes to a unit as a replacement, uh, you'll want to try to find them joining the unit in the morning reports. Um, if they get wounded, sometimes you want to find when they left and when they came back, um, or if they came back, because sometimes they didn't. Uh, and morning reports, sadly, are very difficult to find. Um, some of them are available online. The ones that I know are online are for the 80th Infantry Division, and the 80th also has some morning reports from the 4th Armored Division, because the 4th was attached to the 80th for a brief period. And then I think the 34th division might have morning reports available. The 83rd division has morning reports available online. Um, there's, there's a few others that I'm, oh, the 7th armored division has tons of morning reports available online. But if you're not, if your guy wasn't a member of one of those units, you have to go to the National Archives at St. Louis and kind of wade through some red tape. Yeah. Um, and the National Archives at St. Louis actually haven't been open since COVID hit. Um, so that's like one of the mm -hmm. hardest parts is that like, I have to, I, this whole process for me has been drawn out so much because I can't get to the archives and I can't look at the things I need to look at. Um, but those morning reports are like the key. Like if, if you if you have like a situation like Charles Warren Jones Jr., uh, if you can get a hold of the morning reports, uh, there's a really good chance that you will find what you're looking for. Have you found like a mentor in this field? Like, because what I would wager, <clears throat> I mean, you're Gen Z, right? And you talked about mm -hmm. you talked about like World War One being the forgotten war, you know, a, a forgotten war because it's just too long ago, but. I mean, that's what World War II will eventually become. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at Preston and I's age, our grandparents were of that era. A lot mm -hmm. of them, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, so we grew up with it in a way. Of course, detached as children, they were all very old um, at this point by the time they had us, but it was still within living memory. Yeah. Um, for you, that's really not the case. They were, they're 100 years old right now if, if mm -hmm. they are alive. So your infatuation with it, I feel like is unique for your age. For your yeah, age. sure. Yeah. Um, but I would also have to think that there's somebody, you know, just pairing up with like, let's say a baby boomer doing this sort of same thing as yeah. in fact, in almost like an infatuation with their parents' generation to help like connect all the dots, because I'm sure that there's things that they missed contextually, mm. because as time progressive, the What's nice about it is history starts to become more clear almost. Yes. And, and that's kind of weird because you would think it would be most accurate at the time it happened, but no, there's a lot of inaccurate reporting. And um, I've experienced it myself with just what you're describing with uh, just to record what people are recording down is sometimes mistaken because yeah. the person recording doesn't have the context. Yeah. So what you're describing is really detailed research and history you have a very large um, background in the con of the knowledge of of what was going on big picture yeah and I'm sure that that helps create sort of well it's a puzzle you know and where each little piece yeah. fits um but anyway yeah I don't because it, it seems daunting but at the same time we do have almost we have 80 years of history on the subject too that's right. been written you know propaganda is a real thing yeah um, oh, yeah from back then and anyway, like I've seen it, I, I've done interviews, let's say, with like a uh, with a journalist or something. And as much as they want to, they want to tell the story. They really like really want to. It's not a hit piece, you know. They mm -hmm. they're interested mm -hmm. in the topic, but they have such a limited frame of reference when it comes yeah. to military subjects. But then that piece gets recorded, and that's the article, right? <laughs> Whatever they write is the article and um there's no going back that thing's in print so it's like you might yeah. talk to somebody for 30 minutes or hours and they either it's a um, recorded interview now today with tv yeah, or it's, right or it's just an article um but then that becomes history yes. whatever is written in yes. that newspaper article becomes is the yeah. fact for yes. many people but 
that's not necessarily the case either. It's just what that person happened to write. So anyway, I just feel like it'd be very daunting to sort everything out you're talking about with going to the physical National Archives. Um, you've got online databases now, which we didn't have in the past, yes. which is nice. So it's yeah. like things are getting tied together. But I don't know. I was just curious if you've hooked up with someone that's been, you know, you call yourself a detective. And I totally agree with you. And I see that. But like, it, have you found another detective, too, that's been on the that's a veteran of this sort of work and field? Um, I I think that I have uh, like a few people who I um have like connected with and who have been helpful to me and um I I do think though and that's I think one of the things that was the toughest part for me is that I did have to learn all of this I think on my own and one of the things that I think is a part of that was because um I'm I'm the type of person that like I I really like if I'm gonna do something I do it full full full-hearted like all the way 100 percent And I often found that when I did reach out to people for help, the hardest hurdle for me to overcome, even with the most helpful people, some of the most lovely people, um, was they are talking to a young woman. And so they assume that I don't, they usually assume like by default, no matter how specific I am in my email or that I don't know what I'm talking about. And so... I often have to wade through the very well-intentioned explanation of what a battalion is or of what a division mm. is or, or what campaign something is, you know, until they realize, as I'm saying, as I'm finishing their sentences, they're realizing, oh, okay, you, I don't need to explain this to you. So I think that that's like one of the things, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons why people my age have a hard time engaging in stuff like this, because I think there's often a, an assumption that either we don't really care or we don't really know. Um, I often have to, like, like my boyfriend and I, we go to um, the American Heritage Museum in Hudson, Massachusetts, which is um, an amazing place. I love it there. Um, and every time we go there, the people always walk up to my boyfriend and they're like, they're like, so isn't, you know, your poor girlfriend, you're dragging her along. And he's like, I have like no idea what's going on. Here. <laughs> I mean, I see tanks and I, I think those are cool, but she's, if you want to know, like you can talk to her. And like, I remember I had a really funny interaction and I think this kind of sums up where I'm at with all of it like these people there some of them are incredibly helpful it's just I have to get over the hurdle um there was a reenactment thing that we went to at the American Heritage Museum and there was um a group of guys there that were reenacting a 101st airborne unit but all it said was E company and so I said E company what 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 regiment you know and and one guy said 501st and I said oh really like you're you're doing like not the 506th you're doing like easy company of the 501st and the other guy goes no no the 506th the easy company and I was like I was like yeah I I know that hundreds yeah (laughs) yeah no I I know that but I mean like I thought you said 501st well he meant 506th and I was like oh okay and he's like but it's it's easy company like from band of brothers I'm like yeah I know I, I know that and they're like what why were you were you excited? What were you excited about? And I was like, I was excited about you doing easy company. That wasn't the 506. There were more than one. (laughs) And they were like, they were all very offended, (laughs) you know? And so to me, I was like, yeah. So like, to me, it's like some of them, like talking to them or, you know, they're they're very, they're wealth, wealth of information that they can give you. But sometimes it's just getting over that hurdle of like, I'm not the person they're expecting to be talking to. Um, and so they have to realize that I'm the person to talk to, not the boyfriend standing next to me. Um, in, that, in that same context, I've got some friends that are really into military history that have no background in the military. Yeah. Like a lot of military historians have no background. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Sayer and I have this, uh, I guess, to check the box. Because we were in the military, it's like okay for us to be interested in military history, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, not, not, I don't think it's a, the idea that somebody who served knows more, but almost like it's okay. Yeah. Like it makes sense. It's silly. Um, yeah. but have you ever run into anything like that where it's like a confusion of, wait, why are you interested in world war two if you weren't in the military? 
yeah it's 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 always funny to me I do like get a lot of a lot of questions like and a lot of people are surprised when they realize one how young I am and when they realize and and I don't know why this is like a thing but when they realize I'm more like politically left-leaning I don't know why that's like a thing that people are like whoa what <laughs> um like but, you can't yeah I guess. like I can't like I'm like it's well, kind of like a weird gatekeeping sure. um but I I always like say to people I say and it, I always say like I'm I never take myself too seriously when it comes to things like this like I say to them I I often wonder what a bunch of men from the 1940s would think about a 20 year old college student who's a female who has two lesbian mothers and a biological family and an adoptive family and anxiety and AD, what would they think of me I'm a mess and you know like and and so so to me it's always like I, I have to think like well they'd be happy to be remembered and their relatives are happy to have them remembered yeah. and so like so to me it's it's always like I never get sick of people asking me why are you interested in this because to me it's like I'm interested in this because of all the things that you think would make me not interested in and that's what's special to me it's like I'm interested in how people become who they are I'm interested in how generations become like a identifiable generation mm -hmm. rather than yeah. all of the years blending together I'm I'm interested in I mean I have mental health issues so I'm interested in how an entire generation of people went through something incredibly traumatic and some of them came out and were like okay some of them watched all of their friends get mowed down by a machine gun and they were fine. Like some of them were okay. And then other ones saw one guy they didn't know get shot right in the head and they were never the same person. And or like, less, or less, right? Some of them yeah. just heard gunshots and it could have yeah, wrecked their entire lives. Yeah, that no was idea. a lot. And so like, to me, it's, and it's, it's always, I always try to like, it's very hard sometimes. And it's something that I've learned, especially with like modern awareness around mental health it's sometimes hard not to project things onto the guys I research, which is like a very careful line to walk. Like I have a guy who I, I always feel like I can't quite not project myself. I have a guy from my town, uh, Harold Seymour Roberts, uh, Jewish boy. I'm sorry. Um, These World War II names are all just World War II names, right? They are. Like, they I are, didn't, I there's been a couple of times when you've said a guy from my town and I haven't been sure if it's going to be somebody that you know now or if somebody from World War II, but as soon as you say their as name, as say like, the name, got it. Yeah, that's World War yeah, II. Yeah, yeah. Harold Seymour Roberts. I know. What a name. There was another guy, one, uh, Francis Napoleon Doucette. That one's a fun one. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, so Harold Seymour Roberts, though, he was a Jewish boy. Um, I don't know if, if his family was a practicing Jewish family, but they were 100% like Jewish because. I went back on their census records and they said they spoke Yiddish. So, and he's got a Jewish, um, uh, like military card. Um, it's called the religious it, affiliation piece. Yeah. Yeah. He does have a religious affiliation. So maybe he was practicing, but either way, he was, um, a ball turret gunner, I believe, um, and a bomber. And I think it was like his 17th or 18th mission. He got shot down over, uh, Germany and he was captured um and he was i can't remember the name of the prison um but he was in a stalag luft um i actually even know what cell block he was in because there are some really great records of the place and um as the russians advanced as was the case for many pow's um they were evacuated from the pow camp and they were sent on a march a forced march that lasted 62 days um yeah, uh, through the cold um, with very little food. Um, and in fact, there was a story I read from like someone who was on the march that he said um, some of the guards, like the German guards were like old men. And so they were struggling almost as much as like the POWs were. And so they had a deal where they would carry the soldier's rifle for them and the soldier would just give them his rations. And then whenever someone was coming down to inspect the line, they would hand the rifle back. 
um like it was like a it was like a really like a, everyone was trying to strange find. teamwork and war right right um mm. and so harold seymour roberts according to what i could find i cannot solidly verify this but i could say i'm 75 percent sure i'm right he was kept in Wobelin concentration camp for the last three days of his captivity. Um, this was because uh, Wobelin, although a concentration camp, was one of the overflow options for the POWs that were being marched away from the advancing Russians. And so many of them were just shoved into the gates of that concentration camp and left there. And about three days later, uh, the 82nd Airborne rolled through and liberated the camp. And I don't think that, for, according to his obituary, you know, all it says was he was a member of this, you know, camp, like the Stalag Luft, and that he had survived a forced march. Nothing about the fact that he probably spent the last few days of his captivity in a concentration camp, looking at the very same people that he belonged to. Um, and I cannot help but wonder what that may have done to him seeing all of those people yeah. um every indication tells me he, he came back to the states he worked as i think an insurance officer he got married he had kids he died i don't know <laughs> you know sometimes mm. it's obvious sometimes in their obituary it says donate to this ptsd fund you know sometimes it's obvious I don't know, but it's one of those things where it's like, it's really hard for me not to say, oh my God, he must have been traumatized. Um, I do my best to not project, but at the same time, it's like something like that. Yeah. What, what do you, I mean, what else could happen? I, I don't know. I've heard so. that. I'm sure you have the, the, but people were tougher, right? Or whatever it might be. And yeah, and I, I got it in some senses. I think it's hard to compare toughness from one generation to another. Yeah. Um, but you can't, you, there, there's certain things that if maybe it only impacted half of the number that it would today. I don't know. Right, there's still know. a ton of people. It's millions of people. That's, um, yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's an interesting part of the war for sure. I mean, and it's also, it's something that I see a lot as like a, a younger like person like on TikTok and stuff like every now and then because I'm in like World War II TikTok so every now and then I'll see like some World War II stuff come up in my feed and inevitably every now and then there's like a kids these days and then kids back then and it's like Omaha Beach and like to me one of the things that I actually have found strength in I have had more help from 300 plus dead guys like just in knowing their stories and like to me there's not I see I don't see it as oh I'm not that tough like I couldn't do it's like whatever is making you like think any type of way feel any type of way in a moment is the most important thing in that moment if you're getting shot at that is the most important thing in that moment if you have six essays to write three 100 plus readings to do and like a massive book that you need to carry in your backpack that's like so heavy it's like you're carrying like an animal in your bag that's all that matters in that moment and like and it's like to me like I don't like like it's apples and oranges but at the same time it's the same like fundamental principle you are going to feel the strongest about the thing you are experiencing in a moment and I, to me, like when I, whenever I'm having a rough day, like whenever I'm like, oh my God, I, like I can't today, like I can't do it. I don't think, give me the courage of, you know, this World War II person who served in combat. I think, give me like the grace and the resilience of this person sure. that I've researched, you know, because to me, it's like, it's not like I need that strength. I've got, I've got it. I think, I don't know how I would do in combat. Don't, I don't know, but I do know that I can be resilient and I can be graceful just like them so it's it's like that that's that gives me strength and that I draw from that and that makes me that makes me stronger and I hope that it's like an exchange in which I'm telling their stories that they haven't been able to get out and in doing that 
I'm getting strength to kind of tell my own story and to keep myself going. Um, it's a nice, like, it's a weird give and take, <laughs> I guess. So, Autumn, I've, you've got... I, well, gotcha. I was going to say my perspective is, my perspective has always been as a kid for almost any historian or a historical person, not just World War II, is like, hey, if they can do it, so can I. Yeah. You know, and yeah. um, they're not special. I'm not special. <laughs> um, so if they can do it, so can I. Yeah. And to not put people on a pedestal mm -hmm. because they're just everyday people. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, I agree with you and especially about the present, you know, living in the present because it's the only reality that exists. The future is yeah. imaginary and so is the past. It's a figment in our brains. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they were doing was what was before them and what they had to do. But then I will, the comment I would say about that whole, um, oh, the kids these days, because <laughs> I hate that. I hate yeah. that. Um, because let's, you know how you're going to be judged uh, 50 years from now, they're going to talk about the senior, the senior class that had to go through the pandemic. Cause that's, mm. that's a, that is a collective shift in our society in a very, mm very big way it's the berlin wall coming down it's 9 11 um it's atomic bomb being dropped there are certain things that happen or it's pearl harbor yeah and so where were you when that happened you know i'm just my youngest started kindergarten that year so that's probably going to be a thing for them um i'm just i was a random dude in my 30s it's whatever but i feel like those that are coming of age at that time when you can't uh, basically, you, it's been red, you've been red pilled at a very early age where mm -hmm. you, you see it in front of you with neither political party doing anything. Mm -hmm. So we can't like worship our heroes of, of politics the way we used to be able to do and, and the pettiness and all of that stuff. Um, 50 years from now, people are going to view that like, I can't believe they did. Do you go to college even, right? Because, or do you just make a million dollars on Bitcoin? You have so many decisions to make. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's hard. Uh, that's what makes it hard to put in perspective because uh, 80 years ago, they didn't have a decision to make. Yeah. And that's very easy. The decision to, you go to church every single Sunday, you show up, you go to Sunday school, you go to school, you get drafted, you fight. There are no decisions to be made. There's no what ifs. There's no living in the future or living in yeah. the past. It is the present. Well, okay, now I got to do what I have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that, and what they had to do back then was horrible. Mm. You know, the reason that guard and the prisoner were, were sharing resources along this trek was because neither one probably wanted to be there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they there they were. Yeah. So you got to figure it out. And that's it no matter what yeah I mean, that basically is life and the fact that when you were talking about the uh um the two mothers with the missing it one's missing in action one is kia one's getting letters one stop getting letters mm -hmm. how commonplace that was mm -hmm. in world war ii on top of the fact that these people had uh they had war rations mm -hmm. you had war bonds you had your and gardens. air raids, sirens. You yeah. had in Europe, they were dealing with air raids. Yeah. And all these males, young males going off to war, who, by the way, were your age doing these incredible mm -hmm. things. So mm -hmm. it's like, so if we're going to put them on a pedestal doing these things, you know, the youth can do uh, achieve certain yeah. and, and, and things. Their it doesn't matter where you are. Their generation faced a lot of the same criticisms that every young generation does. Like, it's so clear in the papers, like people are like, kids these days, kids these days. Yep. And then they go and they win World War II and they're like, oh, okay. Now they're the greatest. They're driving yeah. their they're fast solid. cars. I, I don't mean that to downplay them. There's some awesome folks. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're driving their fast cars and going to movies. The <laughs> old people back then would have been like, that's disgusting because they didn't have <laughs> movies and cars and, and smooching girls yeah. up on the hilltop. But they were doing that too, right? Because they're again, normal. They're normal people. They're all humans. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just trying to get by yeah. but my point is it's a blessing that's the whole point yeah. why it's not hard today yeah because if it if we had to live the life that they had in the great depression they would have that means we lost yeah yeah exactly to, you know half a million people die uh and, and things like that 
and to have to tighten the belt the way they did, that means they lost. We're a product of success. Yeah. And so are we, are we going to complain about that now? Do we have it so good that that's what we complain about and how fortunate we are? I mean, sometimes it's, it's sad to see, like, I do see sometimes people like every now and then, like, like YouTube comments are just full of like, we need to have another world war to teach the kid. And it's like, oh, hold on, hold on. That is like a slap in the face to every person who has ever been in combat. Because I'll tell you this, they could be the meanest person in the world. And they, I, I guarantee you, they would not look at a kid as an adult, as like a maybe a 50 year old man or woman and say, I want that for you. <laughs> like that just doesn't happen. I mean, I mean, even like the Vietnam War, uh, there was a, a man from my town who served uh, in, in Europe, was captured by the Germans on Christmas Day. He woke up staring down the barrel of a king tiger. He thought he was dead. Uh, mm. He came home. He had a son and he was driving his son up to college and he pulled over and he, he looked at his son. It was the only time he ever talked about the war with his son. He said to his son, he said, if you don't want to go to Vietnam, if they call you and you don't want to go, I will get you out of here. Interesting. So, I mean, like, there are, there are, I, I think that in general, it's so different for everyone, but, like, I think they don't, I don't think anyone wishes death, destruction, artillery fire, and machine guns on other people unless they've got some really serious issues. Not really. I think that stuff's thrown out, um, yeah. not recognizing what it actually means and not, right. You know, what is what is four percent of a population lost in war feel like in <sighs> France in World War One countries in World yeah. War One? But uh, Autumn, um, your podcast, Reading's Boys Facebook page, mm. and all of the articles in the Reading Post, there's a little note that says a book in progress. Yes. Is it going to yeah. be a compilation of those articles? Is it something different? So um, when I started writing the articles, I like. <sighs> When, and I think I still like I'm still I haven't technically finished the articles I have to do that um I was working with like 30 guys give or take that I had found early on in my research and as I was like I told you right I have like 300 to 400 guys now that's not 30 um and to me it's like one of the things that I love about Reading and that I like to think makes Reading special even though it's not that special in the grand scheme of things we have a guy who served in the first special service force. Oh, we have cool. a guy. Yeah. We have a guy who served in the Rangers who then went on to serve in Korea and was dishonorably discharged because he was gay. We have a guy mm. from town who served two, three guys from town who served with Merrill's Marauders. We have yeah. a guy from town, uh, no, a handful of guys from town that served with the 10th mountain division. We have three guys that served with the 11th airborne in the Pacific um, and we have a good number of guys that served on really interesting ships. We have a guy that served on a Coast Guard cutter. We have a guy who served um, on a, a, in the Coast Guard on a, on a Coast Guard manned naval vessel that was in the same exact convoy that another Coast Guardsman from Reading went down in, okay. like was killed in a, in a ship that was torpedoed. And there was another Reading man within like in that same mm -hmm. convoy in the coast guard we have the only thing we reading doesn't have to my knowledge we have fighter pilots we have bomber pilots we have crewmen we don't have any marine raiders that's the only thing that i have that was a small group have. yeah yeah but think about i mean out of all the amazing different forces that served in world war ii there is only one that i cannot find a Reading man having served with so snapshot of America right there isn't it right that's like it's like mm -hmm. a, it's like taking a little piece out of the pie and showing the world if this is what this small town I mean according to numbers we had 1500 men serve I think maybe it was 2500 I'm not sure out of those men we had 33 killed we only had one marine killed and he wasn't even technically from Reading um, he was adopted by a family in Reading and then moved away. So we didn't have any Marines killed, really, except for this one guy um, out of all these men. And so to, to me, I, I, we've got some fantastic stories of women. We've got um, 
a woman who was one of the first uh, like high ranking officers in the Women's Army Corps. She was one of the first classes of like women to graduate as an officer. Wow. We've got Marines who are women. We've got uh, one fantastic woman, um, Myrtle Harris, who was an ensign and she served aboard a hospital ship in the aftermath of the atomic bombings. And they mm. got a lot of a lot of um, civilians that they were trying to treat. Yeah. And um, and she wrote home about it. We have a woman from town who was appointed to be a teacher at a Japanese internment camp. Mm. Like, this that is, is like, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Across the board. Yeah. And really so to across me, the board. I have to tell all these stories because to me, it's like, I think not only do I owe it to my town, the town that has given me so much, but I think I owe it to, to myself and to these people to show the world that there's a story everywhere. And so the book to me, as it might be really thick, it might be multiple volumes, I don't know. But I want the world to know that every single one of these people had a story that's worth telling, but more importantly, they had a story worth remembering. Um, because it doesn't, I mean, like the service that a lot of these people gave didn't ever really end. Whether it, it you know, whether they continued to serve into Vietnam, some of them did. We had guys who served and lived through all of World War II and then got killed in Korea. Um, it, their stories, for some of them, their stories died with them. But for some of them, their service has continued on in the form of like scholarships, in the form of their name sitting on a plaque in you know a school lobby. Um, and I, I, want, I want people to know them. You know, because that was the thing that bothered me the most when I started this project was that I was hearing all these names. Fred Melvin Day killed in action. Richard Charles Austin killed in action. Roy James Gerard killed in action. All these people, I had never heard their names before. I had no idea who they were. And that is the problem to me. And that's what I want to fix. <laughs> I want people to know their names. Well, you're doing a good job of it. Um, it's, yeah. impor it's important work and you're getting that message out there yeah thank you <laughs> you're just getting started i mean you have so much i mean it's that's what's exciting about it so keep the passion keep the writing you're getting better you know you're always you have a great writing voice already you know a, you. and so just keep doing it and you're gonna find the path that it takes you down you might not even know where it is yet but it's gonna you're laying it in front of you you just don't see it yet yeah, no, I just gotta, yeah, I just gotta keep going. And that's what I'm, I'm gonna do. <laughs> I like it. Well, Autumn, thanks so much for taking the time. We'll put links to everything in the uh, yeah. description here. So check out our podcast, Facebook page and read some of those articles and let us know when that book comes out. So we can take a look. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. All right, Autumn, we'll talk soon. <laughs>